Okay, good afternoon um, to everyone and welcome to this uh, forum on Brexit. Um, this is actually the second time this forum at the law school has taken place focusing on Brexit. The first was just two and a half years ago, shortly after the vote in Britain, um, the referendum vote took place. And I think that was a very tumultuous time. We had a big turnout, as we have again today. And interestingly, um, it is just as much, I think, a tumultuous time now. Um, and there is as, probably as much uncertainty still characterizing the implications of the vote and what the future path of the United Kingdom and the European Union is, what their future relationship will be, as there was then. So. I want to say just maybe a few more words about that before I introduce you to our panelists today and uh, open up our discussion. Um, and after hearing from the various panelists on a number of issues, we'll also open the floor to questions from you. But it may seem strange, it is strange, that 33 months, that is two years and nine months after uh, a small but decisive majority of the British people voted to leave the, the European Union. Um, today, as we speak right now, the British Parliament, for the first time, is discussing the possible substantive future relationship of the United Kingdom with the EU. And it's doing so two days before the date of the 29th of March, on which the United <coughs> Kingdom was to leave, um, automatically exit the European Union. So how is that? How is it possible that two days before the date of automatic exit, two and three quarter years after the vote, the referendum vote, how is it possible that we're still in a situation, as I think the BBC News put it yesterday in one of their headlines, in a permanent series of question marks? It feels as if Brexit remains a permanent series of question marks, despite the time that has elapsed since that momentous vote. So I think what we're going to try to do today is to try to bring some clarity, insofar as we can, to the set of issues that are still on the table, um, to try to say a little bit about how we have got to hear what has been happening in the two and three quarter years since that Brexit vote, and then to move on to really to try to think a little bit about what are the possible paths forward. Because at the moment, the, I think there are many possible paths, but the four main ones, leaving without a deal uh, on April 12th, leaving with a deal on May 22nd, um, to revoke the decision to leave and remain, or to have a second referendum. And there are many multiple variations on each of those. Um, but those options are all still on the table, just as they have been. Um, for a long time. So we want to try to look a little at how we've gotten to here and look a little bit at what's ahead and maybe just hear from the panelists who are all very um, expert in as different aspects of the whole uh, set of Brexit <coughs> issues to hear from them uh, what their views are. And just to, to say one final thing before I introduce the panelists and that is that you know, the, the issue on which the public voted uh, two years ago was a very simple binary one. It was put in very simple binary terms, namely, should Britain leave the EU or not? Should Britain remain? Should Britain, should the UK leave? Should the UK remain? But what underlies that question, of course, is a much bigger set of questions, and that's where we still are. And, and the bigger set of questions concerns what should the relationship of the UK be to the European Union? What should that relationship be? So that's the crux of uh, the issue and I think of a lot of the complexity. So with that, let me just briefly um, introduce our various speakers. Our first speaker, who's not physically present, but I think you can see her picture on the screen and she's here with us on mic, um, is Professor Calypso Nicolaides. And she's a professor of international relations from Oxford University um, and a fellow of St. Anthony's College. And she is publishing shortly, I think, a book on Brexit, and she has written for many decades on the European Union, on trade relations, and uh, most recently on Brexit. To my left is a partner from Latham & Watkins, our kind sponsors for the forum today, Rob Moulton. He's a partner in the London office and a member of the law firm's Brexit 
task force. So he's someone who, unlike academics like us, who can sit back and think, what do we think? He actually has to try to grasp the day-to-day -day changing reality of um, what the implications for his clients are and for the government are of the uncertainty launched by the Brexit vote and how to give advice on a whole set of issues going forward. His particular field of expertise is financial services, so he'll speak to us on, a little on some of that. And last but not least, my colleague uh, Rob Howes, who's a professor of international law here at the law school, and although an expert on international trade law and WTO law in particular, has also written extensively about the European Union and more recently on Brexit, including uh, a thoughtful essay on the roads to reversing Brexit. So with that, I'm going to hand over to, for our first broad, I would say, set of questions on how have we got here? What has been happening over the past two and three quarter years um, since the, the referendum? And uh, what has happened in the UK over that time? What the content of Theresa May's deal is um, and why that deal has had such difficulty in getting adopted until now. So I'm going to begin and hand over to Professor Nicolaides um, to get the ball rolling. Well, uh, um, hello, uh, Grenya. Hello, Rob and Rob. And um, let me just first say that I'm very sorry not to be with you, but at least I'm with you in spirit and virtually, um, because, of course, this is a topic that I know fascinates all of you and all of us, uh, how not to be a Brexit attic. What an, an amazing um, situation we're in, as Professor de Burke had just described. But is it surprising? Perhaps we should start by saying that, no, it's not surprising that after two and a half years we're st still in this situation, because it's never been done before. Uh, what a momentous thing it is to undo 46 years of cooperation and entanglement. And what a, an amazing and in, unprecedented event to create, when you think of it, a new animal in the international sphere that is something called the former EU member state. How do we invent this, this animal? How do we invent the status for the UK? And indeed, let us realize as we start this conversation that for the last two and a half years, we've been discussing Brexit 1.0, only the withdrawal agreement and some vague commitment to what will be the special future relationship, Brexit 2.0. But this Brexit 2.0 is, is still in the making and will be reinvented in the next two or three years as, as Britain goes into a transition period and then a, 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 a new relationship. So everything is still up for grabs in, in, a, in, a, in a way. And when um, Professor de Burke had described the future scenarios, these indeed will, are described in vague terms in the political declaration. So why is it that we, um, that we are still in this very fluctuating and hybrid state? Let me just say one thing about three actors here that matter, the British public, the parliament, and the prime minister. Because of course we need to start with the British public. Um, has the British public changed since uh, it, the, 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 the vote in June 2016? Well, to some extent, it hasn't. In fact, people voted on positional terms rather than valence, as we say in politics. That is, they voted from identity viewpoints. We all talk about this in the Trump era, but it's worth recalling that the British vote comes from where people live, how educated they are, and what age they are. And this only changed because, well, some people have died and some people have, um, uh, have become um, age voting. So, but aside from that, people haven't really changed their mind. And in fact, their identity, you know, who you want to go out with, who, who you are, is more defined these days in Britain by um, leave or remainer than by left, right. Isn't this an amazing change of, uh, uh, of the state of things? But at the same time, in fact, when you look at um, polling on and, and social studies on what people believe in terms of policy, they're much more ambivalent. And if we think of the spectrum that defines this issue as with so much in international relations between, on one hand, those who prefer cooperation and those who prefer control, 
getting back control as the whole Brexit agenda is about. Well, you know, people are somewhere in between. They're not at one end or the other. And that is that they are ambivalent and they understand that you need a bit of both. So that's where the public is. And then the question is whether the parliament reflects this public or not. And yes, the British parliament, to some extent as a whole, is ambivalent. You have small minorities of deputies on both extremes, but the, 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 the majority of the parliament is groping for somewhere in between. And if you have a theory of the British parliament that is fusion, that is Westminster model, is that, well, this parliament should follow its, um, its prime minister and its government, as it has traditionally done, then, then yes, we are in a kind of crazy situation of breakdown, because now anything goes, and we, we're not sure well, from one day to the next what the deputies will vote in their majority. But if you think of the British Parliament also as about checks and balance, uh, well, then it is doing its job. It's trying to uh, make the deal better because the deal that is today on the table by the prime minister is indeed a compromise, so perhaps desirable, but many believe that there could be a better compromise, um, a, indeed a, a compromise that reflects a public opinion which overall wants to be politically and symbolically out, but not necessarily economically. So the parliament today is groping for this compromise, this ambivalent um, public position, and it's possible that in the next few days it will get there. But then a lot depends on our third actor here, Theresa May, the prime minister, whose life depends on keeping her party together. And if she moves with what might be economically desirable, that is a position somewhere um, closer to the single market, closer to economic integration while being out, she fears that her, her party will break down because the extreme, the, those, the arch Brexiters, those who would prefer to leave even without a deal, might break up the party. I don't think they would, but that's the, the, the very big dilemma that she's in. So I, I just leave you with these thoughts and happy to come back on any of those or on the much, um, much more uh, central question of the Irish backstop and all the rest of it, if you if we can pick that up in the discussion. Great, thank you very much um, for those very interesting opening remarks. Um, I think maybe we'll get onto some of the detail of uh, the deal and some other issues around uh, what has been happening, what has been negotiated over the last uh, two years um, with our second speaker, Rob Moulton. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I mean, I, I'd just like to pick up one, one point over this two and a half year period, which is I have a, a colleague in Frankfurt one of my partners who pointed out to me at some point in 2017 that um, he hoped the UK would hurry up and decide what it was that we wanted and, and let them know so that they could say no. And, um, and I think that was sort of the starting point for this as a negotiation because, as you've heard, the question that was put to the British people, and I am the British people for today's purpose, I suspect, I'll try to reflect as many views from it as I can, um, was a straightforward yes, no one. But actually, the options that followed from that yes, no, are multiple. And Brexit as a topic defies the normal political discourse. It does not fall into our party political system, which the entire constitution has evolved to try to deal with. Because different parts of different parties think different things about whether the EU is a, a good or bad thing. And because there are therefore multiple options for different ways to leave, even those who did not want to leave but say, well, look, we must respect the result of this referendum, will have a favourite way of leaving. But there are many of them, and therefore none commands a majority. And so really our government has, Theresa May's approach has been to keep the party together, because if, if two years ago she'd have settled on one particular route out, she would have had resignations from every part of her government that didn't agree with it. And so... It's been the classic can down the road because doing some, even though two days before the supposed date, we're only getting around to deciding how to try and do anything. Um, because any, any earlier decision destroys the government, destroys the prospects of her being able to lead um, you know, any, any sort of route out. But we do then end up with a deal on the table. Um, and 
as you've heard, it's the result of a negotiation. And when there are half a dozen ways of doing something and you negotiate anything as complicated and that's never been done before like this, you end up with a, a classic compromise. And only those closely associated with that compromise ever understand exactly what was given up in return for what. How did we get to where we are? We can't reopen this part. We had to give here to get that. And everyone outside that room sees the parts that they don't like in the compromise because they don't understand that that's compromise, you know, how that necessarily how that compromise has come about. I think as, a, as an overall package, although the withdrawal process and the political declaration, the political declaration <coughs> in particular being very open, vague, could go in a number of different directions, but as a package of measures, to me, the EU could only do one of two things. It could either try to hurt the UK on exit in order to deter other would-be leaving nations, or it could try and come up with something balanced that broadly fits how they would deal with developed economies if they were negotiating anything else. And to me, the deal looks much more like the latter than the former. Um, and, and that is why it is in some ways surprising. I mean, we had a sweepstake at my work, and I'll let you into a secret, which will automatically discount everything I'm about to say from this moment onwards in your minds, which was I thought Theresa May would win that deal, the one that she lost with the biggest defeat in the history of the Mother of Parliaments. Mm -hmm. but, I, but I thought that before any of the analysis had actually been done with what, the, you know, my first reading of the withdrawal agreement was I think she'll get this through before I'd been able to pick up what people were actually feeding back about it. But it's the politics that defeat it rather than the economics to me because it's very difficult for a politician to say I agree with Theresa May's deal when that ties you to one course of action when you may have a second favourite. The problem with Brexit is no one can admit to having a second favourite route because it is so politically charged. And you only have a first, if you, a bit like proportional representation, I'm not voting for anyone else, I don't want a second or third. And so that is, I think, part of the reason why we end up, even with a deal that objectively I think of as reasonably balanced. I'm surprised it's probably as balanced as it is. I think it could have been worse. It's definitely not perfect. It's got its problems. You can't get a parliament to vote for it. And that's why we're still two days beforehand. In the, as a lawyer, the, I'm going to have to redo Constitutional 101 after all of this, because all the things I learned about the way that law gets made are currently dispensed with. Today is the first day in several hundred years that parliament has set the agenda, not the government. And no one taught me what that meant or what happens with what the votes that come out of it mean. And um, so, so that, that's, I think, part of the backdrop as to, as to the agreement and, and, and how we got to where we are. Um, I'm aware that some of you here may not understand the difference between the withdrawal agreement and the political declaration or even what the content of the deal might be. I, I don't know whether our next speaker might want to speak to some of that um, before making further comments. Uh, I would I would rather that uh, uh, either uh, the chair or the previous speaker um, um, address the the contents of the withdrawal agreement. It's around 600 pages, and um, because I'm not operationally active on an hour-to-hour -hour basis, um, my reflections will be of a a broader character and. Um, I have to admit, I haven't read all of those pages. Um, um, so I defer to the other speakers if they're prepared to say something about them. So I have a, let me, let me do you two minutes. I did some work for the government on the withdrawal agreement, which is one of those um, truly frustrating moments of my professional career. Um, th I mean, the withdrawal agreement, the, the, the withdrawal agreement is being done under what is known as Article 50. And that permits a quick arrangement between, the, effectively, the, the, the Commission and the European infrastructure, but not the member states. They get no say in this, individually. It's a quick agreement between the leaving country and the European institutions. But it's only allowed to deal with the stuff that's necessary to withdraw. It cannot be the basis of a trade arrangement. That has to be done through a different legislative process in which each member state gets the chance to vote it down. Canada recently felt the strength of the Walloonian Parliament in Belgium, one of their sub-parliaments that refused to vote through the Canadian arrangement first time round. And so, but the withdrawal agreement really only does three things. It says, we have to deal with what happens to the people that currently live in the different member states, because there are Brits. The colloquialism is it's Brits who live in Spain and it's Polish builders who live in London. And so what do we do with all of these people who've taken their free movement rights because they'll lose them, where the basic arrangement is they can continue to do what they do? 
What do we do with the UK paying its bill for leaving, which is somewhat made up but not entirely inaccurate? There's some guesstimates in there, but the UK needs to pay certain um, uh, uh, obligations that are, that are owed. And what do we do with the problem of Northern Ireland? Uh, <coughs> I grew up in an era where my parents worried about me travelling to London, which was a 50-mile train journey, to go to the shops because bombs went off in London. And the peace treaty was determined upon there never being a border between the North and the South of Ireland. It was a critical component of it. That defies leaving a customs arrangement, which requires people to understand which goods are passing between outside and inside. And so the... That, that aspect of saying, let's keep Northern Ireland within the customs arrangement until we've developed a currently non-existent technological solution. They're the three things it does. And then everything else is really still to be decided with some broad sketched outlines in a political declaration that says, we will try to come up with a reasonably balanced looking set of trade arrangements and access arrangements and so on as, a, as part of a, you know, a future commitment. Great, thank you very much um, to Rob for that. Before I hand over, um, to uh, Rob Howes, just to say that um, that may cause some surprise to some of you because when we hear about Theresa May's deal and voting on the deal, I think many people, you know, intelligent observers, uh, casual observers, think it must be about the terms on which um, the UK and the EU will uh, be going forward, but it's not, as, as uh, Rob has said. It is just, it's a backwards looking to some extent, not, not only backwards looking, but it's dealing with some immediate issues of exit. The bill, the rights of UK citizens uh, in the rest of the EU and EU citizens in the UK. And then this uh, sort of, I don't know how to call it, nuclear <laughs> provision, which has proven the problem in getting the, the deal adopted. And that is trying to respect the peace agreement that has turned Northern Ireland away from 40 years of sectarian <coughs> violence and trauma to a remarkable island of peace and multi, uh, I wouldn't say multi-level governance, but a multiple government. Northern Ireland governs itself, uh, is partly governed by the EU, by the UK and by Ireland. Um, and it has, uh, g since the peace agreement in 1998, you know, gone through its most uh, harmonious and best period uh, ever. and. The significance of that to uh, the people in Ireland is enormous, north and south, but it wasn't, it was just a footnote at the time that the Brexit referendum took place. It wasn't something on anyone's mind and it has turned into something uh, that, that those who are pro-Brexit um, think of as the tail wagging the dog. Now, because of this strange issue of the border somewhere that people don't really understand, there's a provision saying unless and until a proper trade agreement between the UK and the EU is negotiated, the default position is staying in the customs union and the customs union is, uh, and Northern Ireland staying in the single market. And that has all kinds of <coughs> implications for the future. So they feared this was like a hand clutching on and determining the future relationship, even though the political uh, declaration left all that open. So that was the, the conflict, and that's one of the reasons why the withdrawal agreement has not, one of the reasons why the withdrawal agreement has not been able to be adopted, and the UK was not able to leave on those terms, which, as Rob says, were actually rather um, decent terms, all things considered, with the exception of what the implications of this um, border provision are. So with that... Can I... Um, sure. Sorry, Grinja. No, go ahead. Um, I mean, perhaps just to add to what you both just said, because, of course, it's the crux of the matter. And if one follows the debates right now in the British Parliament, um, if only there was a magic wand to solve this Northern Irish um, conundrum, um, Theresa May would get a majority on her agreement, wouldn't she? And why it is so hard, um, one has to also see it from the EU viewpoint, because, of course, the EU would explain that um, the EU, when it enlarges as opposed to shrinks, as it will always create an external border. It did so, for instance, between Poland and the Ukraine when Poland entered the EU. So similarly, it has to create an external border within Ireland, between the south and the north of Ireland. That is structural. That's what the EU is about. And ever since the Brexit vote, therefore, because of all the reasons you both gave, because peace in Ireland is so important and that, that depends on a no border, 
everybody has been looking for the magic trick, the magic wand to make sure you can both have an external EU border somewhere around there and no border in Ireland. And as you just said, Grenya, the, the one of the tricks that was found was to say, well, if we can't figure it out, figure it out within after the transition period, two years after Britain leaves, we'll have to have an insurance policy. And at the beginning, um, the EU kind of found a, a way around all this by saying Northern Ireland will kind of sort of stay in the EU single market and customs union. We will make an exception. We will somehow treat it differently. But of course, this created havoc in the UK. And I say this as a, a Franco-Greek um, living in, in Britain, so seeing it both from within and from outside. But the, the Brits, and not only the DUP, but many mainstream British people said we can't have that because that would create a border within the United Kingdom between Northern Ireland and, uh, and the rest of Great Britain. So it then went, and Theresa May went to Brussels and said, well, you know what? We would like, as an insurance policy, to have a customs union with the whole of the UK. And I tell you, you know, I, I spoke with a lot of capitals at the time when this was agreed, you know, more than a year ago, and the Europeans felt this was a huge concession to allow Britain, as an insurance policy, to be in a customs union without necessarily having the same kind of uh, insurance that it would follow all of the EU rules and not enter into so-called unfair competition. So, so the EU, very strangely, feels that this was a concession on its part, and yet in Britain it's felt as though it's an imposition um, by the EU, at least among the Tories, to stay within um, the ambit, as it were, of the EU. So hence the irony of the whole situation where in the name of a backstop that may, may never happen, um, we have a revolt of a big part of the, of the Tories saying, well, we don't want to enter into a, a contract where we may never get out of, which has been imposed by the EU. It's a very ironic situation. Exactly. Thank you for that further clarification, um, Lutko, and I'll hand over at this stage to Professor Howes. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so um, uh, I think I'll, I'll just pick up uh, from there and um, uh, say a bit about um, what, um, you know, the, um, uh, the expectation is, uh, especially from the point of view of the people um, uh, supporting Brexit about what will happen to uh, the UK's trade relations uh, once uh, Brexit has been uh, accomplished. In other words, once the, um, um, the uh, withdrawal from the EU treaty has been, has been legally uh, effectuated. And, and there, um, the mantra of the Leave folks uh, is, has been WTO rules, and as somebody who spends a lot of my time researching, writing, and teaching about the WTO, I've been at times amused, at times irritated that um, when I search WTO on Twitter these days, most of the entries about the WTO have actually to do with Brexit. And that's really because a, a key, a key uh, argument, and, and indeed, as I say, expectation of the leave is that there will be no, as it were, legal vacuum or black hole uh, with respect to the UK's trading relations when it leaves uh, the EU, when the withdrawal is legally effectuated, because the EU is fully integrated into the World Trade Organization um, and uh, has from the outset not only participated in the WTO, um, uh, as, uh, as a member of the EU under the EU's membership, but has an original independent founding uh, membership. So one of the areas where um, uh, work was relatively effectively and, and in a timely fashion done uh, to manage a transition to Brexit was the negotiations within the WTO that had to take place because in a number of areas, apart from the general rules that every WTO member has to observe, like non-discrimination, for example, there are specific kinds of commitments 
that are, that are scheduled um, that bind WTO members on a range of issues, including, for example, agricultural quotas, subsidies, and, and so on. So it, it, although the UK has always been on its own a member of the WTO, um, its commitments on these issues have been simply um, uh, EU collective commitments. And therefore, it was necessary to, um, to go back to other WTO members and have a discussion about what these commitments would be, um, uh, assuming that they were no longer being made uh, on behalf of the UK by the EU as a whole, but made uh, by uh, the UK as a separate member. And obviously, some WTO members would say, uh, we, we aren't going to give the same concessions or accept the same uh, terms of commitments based upon dealing with one country that we would be if, if, if those commitments were the collective commitments of all WTO members. But there have been, in fact, extensive discussions at the WTO about this, and a range of these issues has been settled. So there is some truth to um, the position of the Leave that there will be a, a legally certain framework for trade uh, immediately after the, um, uh, 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 the withdrawal, uh, if it does indeed happen, uh, uh, from the EU uh, is given uh, legal um, e effect. But of course the problem, and this comes back to the earlier discussion, is that you have to then uh, have all of these goods passing through the border um, and being cleared uh, through customs on the basis of the application of um, uh, WTO tariff schedules and other forms of uh, WTO uh, uh, law or other, other aspects of WTO law. So, um, you know, even though there's no legal vacuum, I mean, a lot of the uncertainty is about how the border will suddenly emerge and, you know, and, and actually function on a practical basis so that there aren't enormous uh, bottlenecks in, um, you know, the, uh, for example, the importation of goods um, into, uh, into uh, uh, the UK, which is why many people are really quite in, in panic mode because it's hard to imagine you know, even though the legal certainty is there, I mean, we know what the MFN bound rates of tariff are uh, that would have to be applied, but we don't know how you can kind of overnight create a, an effective customs apparatus that would clear all these goods through the border with any kind of reasonable degree of, of, of dispatch. And so that's, you know, that's something that has never really been uh, being uh, solved. I think on the EU side, they've done some serious thinking about it, about how they will manage the border, but I, my sense, and my fellow panelists will correct me, is that this has not been effectively thought through and the logistical arrangements have not been uh, put in place to have a, an efficient, smoothly functioning uh, border up and running uh, the, day of the, um, uh, the day of the withdrawal. But I stand to be corrected on that because um, I don't have the pleasure of spending my entire life reading about Brexit blow by blow. By blow. Um, but I just wanted to come back to some more, um, you know, broad global points because um, many of us here are interested in this issue from many different points of view, from what's going on with democracy, not only in the UK, but in other places in the world, including uh, the, uh, the United States from the point of view of how the rule of law functions. Uh, and, um, and also, I think, from the point of view of, um, you know, again, um, you know, what one would think about in terms of the longer, uh, the longer future of the relations between the UK and the, and the EU. And, and I think the, um, the first point I'd like to make, and very quickly, is that, is that Brexit is often, and especially in the US media, but not only the US media, associated with populism. So if you were to basically read about uh, Brexit from mainstream media commentators in the United States, you would have the idea that Brexit originated by some kind of popular rebellion against the political elites 
in the UK where the people insisted on a vote and, and felt that the elites were not reflecting their political preferences. But in fact, it's really just the opposite, that the, the whole Brexit conceit emerged through a conflict within the elites of the Conservative Party and a, a relatively opportunistic move by one faction led by uh, David Cameron to use the Brexit issue and a possible referendum on it to gain a, a sort of political advantage within you know, their own uh, uh, party. Um, and, and I mean, you could go back decades in, in British history and you know, the elites, in fact, have been divided about this. But it's not as if um, there was a spontaneous uprising of the people that demanded that there be a, a, um, a referendum. And the people seem to me at least as much represented by the, mil you know, the six million who now signed a petition that the notice should be revoked as any group that was demanding uh, that there would be a referendum. But the instigation for the referendum was not public pressure. It was, it was, it was an idea that was thought up within the Conservative Party for reasons of um, you know, political uh, uh, positioning and maneuvering uh, among the uh, elites. Um, so, that's the, so that's the populism myth, and I, I think we should really discard that as, as, as what's fundamentally going on in this situation, regardless of what we think might be going on elsewhere in, in, um, in Europe, in Hungary, or Poland, or whatever. This is not really um, about, about populism. Uh, secondly, on the rule of law and the role of parliament, um, and again, I stand to be corrected because I'm not a a UK constitutional lawyer, but it, it seems to me in many ways the current situation um, uh, was very much set up by a fundamental decision of the Supreme Court uh, uh, in, in Britain um, that I've actually written about, which is the Miller decision, where um, the court held that um, the changes involved in, in Brexit would be of a constitutional character and therefore that it would be not the uh, prerogative of, um, uh, uh, of the prime minister and cabinet uh, to make the crucial decisions, but ultimately those decisions had to be the, in the control of parliament. And I would imagine that, that, that actually um, the events would have unfolded differently if, if, if the Supreme Court had basically allowed um, uh, the, uh, the Prime Minister and her cabinet, or at least the, um, the inner circle of the cabinet, um, to uh, control uh, the decision on the terms of withdrawal and not to have to put it before, before Parliament. So uh, we're all in some sense, uh, whether we think for good or for ill, uh, operating here under the shadow of what uh, the court decided in Miller, which it seems to me, uh, from the point of view of constitutional theory or philosophy, is extremely, ex extremely sound, um, in, in fact. So that's just a footnote about, about the rule of law and whether um, uh, you know, there's some real dysfunction in the British Parliament that makes it unequipped to play its role. And, uh, I think many observers initially, before the Miller case, would have thought the parliament wasn't going to be uh, put in the position of, of, of playing uh, this kind of role. Obviously, at the limit, you could have a non-confidence vote and bring down the government, but short of that, that basically the international negotiations and the content of any agreement with the rest of the EU would be determined uh, by the executive and, not, and, and would not be under the direct control um, of, um, of parliament. The third point um, is about going forward. And, and here, I, w I really want to echo what Calypso said, which is, <clears throat> in a way, all options are on the table. What's become very evident, and to me it's a very good thing, is that, is that the, the, the rest of the EU has not adopted a punitive stance towards uh, the, e the UK withdrawal. In fact, it's, uh, the EU uh, institutions have done a remarkable job of creating a functional negotiation, e given all of the complex governance challenges of an entity in some ways as unwieldy as the, as the EU. They managed to form 
a coherent team um, to engage in these negotiations. It's just that the UK has not been um, uh, a very um, uh, successful interlocutor in the sense that um, even the cabinet being divided in the UK about what it wanted, they would, you know, they would change their minds every other day when they were in talks with the European negotiators. But Europe um, has basically taken a facilitative approach that this is a decision of the UK and we want to make it happen in as orderly a way as possible and in a way as least disruptive of the values and principles upon which the European order is founded. So given that that is the attitude, I see no particular reason that even if we were dealing with what for many, including myself, would seem like a worst case scenario, which would be the so-called hard Brexit, where um, there's, a, uh, there's a definitive rejection of the treaty of withdrawal, and there's simply an exit based upon international law, including WTO, Vienna Convention on Law of Treaties, and all of those kind of background international law uh, norms. Even on that worst case perspective, I think that there's room for uh, reconsideration and indeed what I would call rejoin. That, that the popular energy that is now behind the idea of revoking Article 50, um, if there were new political leadership in, in the UK, and this may take 10 years, it may take 15, if there were new political leadership that, uh, that, that drew upon that energy, I don't see it as at all impossible that the UK will end up rejoining the EU, maybe under some different arrangement, or maybe as a, as a full, you know, normal member um, at some future point in time. And this goes to a nuance I would like to introduce uh, to, um, uh, to something Calypso said at the outset, um, uh, which is that, you know, people of the referendum in a way voted their identity, so not much has changed in terms of um, those kinds of, you know, positions of overall being pro-leave versus pro-remain, uh, except that there are more younger voters and some of the older ones have died off and so on. Um, well, I think something has changed, and, and, um, and this is the creation of an explicit political identity for what I would describe as young, urban, educated, multicultural people in the UK, who I think a lot of them, they might have been involved in some particular cause, animal welfare, um, environment, um, you know, affordable housing in London, whatever, but uh, were primarily not politically engaged or mobilized uh, people. And, uh, and now, um, in response to being told that you can't have a second referendum, that there's no second chance, and that the current generation is selling out their own vision of the future uh, by undertaking Brexit, um, this group, um, you know, um, not uh, particularly, I think, in general interested in and perhaps cynical about mainstream party politics, is, is becoming politically conscious and capable of real political mobilization. And one of the most frustrating things is that, in general, they're on the left or center left, and that the way in which the Labour Party has positioned itself, and we can talk more about this, and, and particularly its leader, Jeremy Corbyn, has been such that it has completely flopped in trying to mobilize that energy to renew uh, Labour. And this, it seems to me, is roughly analogous to the situation in the United States, where in many ways the Trump administration resulted in a political mobilization of people who are not necessarily directly involved in party politics in the past and has resulted in, in, in uh, um, uh, leadership figures like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez being elected to the U.S. Congress and, 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 and so forth. Uh, there is a new political force that's, that's emerging, and similar to labor under Corbyn, I mean, you know, in the US, the mainstream of the Democratic Party views this force as, as really much more of a threat than a possibility of, um, uh, you know, of moving forward to uh, a new winning political coalition um, in, in the future. But all of this is to say that I think we need to pay some attention 
um, uh, you know, to the mobilization of this kind of um, uh, new political uh, or the, the forming of the consciousness of what we call almost a new uh, political class that wasn't overtly politicized or engaged in party politics uh, before this. Great. Many thanks for those comments. Um, time is uh, beginning to run short, and I think it might be a good idea to uh, bring some of the audience in with your questions um, and to continue in Q&A. There will be a microphone going around, so feel free to put up your hands if you have a question. Um, I might start with one which is uh, maybe obvious to some of you but may not be, which is that um, it may seem odd to many of you that given what Rob uh, House has just described, which is the incredibly strong mobilization for Europe, for the EU, the sense that maybe something has changed in the meantime, or that there's a, a, a strong uh, pro-EU constituency out there that wants a chance to hear again what the country thinks overall of the various routes ahead. Um, why is it that a, a second referendum has become the least likely outcome, that, that the idea of calling for a second referendum seems doomed not to, uh, not to happen, even though six million people almost have signed a petition asking for a revocation, the most extreme Remain version, to revoke Article 50, and even though a million people marched through London last weekend, um, why is it that uh, that that option remains the last on the list um, and is, is seen as not really likely to happen. Um, we can talk about that, but I'm hoping to see some hands first from the audience. So yes, I see there's two here, one in the middle and one over to the right. Hi there. Um, in the last few seconds, Theresa May announced that she wouldn't uh, remain in her place for the next stage of the Brexit negotiations, so I wondered if you could, I could garner some comments on that, maybe. I mean, the first comment is never speak about Brexit in front of other people because you are out of date by the <laughs> end, <laughs> yeah. no matter how well you prep. Though, unfortunately, I'm not sure how much this changes things, but it certainly introduces a new dimension. I think I'll take the second question, and then I'll go back to each of the speakers for a reaction. Hi. Uh, so I have two questions very, very fast. The first one concerns the last remarks by, made by Professor House, and it's about do you think or, uh, that the people that mobilized for the Corbyn election to the Labour Party leadership with momentum in some way corresponds to the young people that marched in London against Brexit the last week and also to the people that signed the petition against Brexit. And the second question is, like we, we said, you, you said several times that in fact like the clear cut option, yes or no, with regard to exiting the EU must re in reality many different options. And do you think that if a second referendum is held, like the ballot should be cast, do you want to leave or to remain in the EU, or do you want, or in a more complex way, in order to um, to take in, uh, into account the fact that there are many living options on the table? Great. So I'm going to start with Professor Nicolaitis. Uh, Calypso, would you like to address either of those two? Any reflections on Theresa May's agreement to step down, or what might be in? the content of a second referendum and also whether those mobilizing pro-EU are the same as those who voted for Corbyn. Right, well, uh, uh, I couldn't hear the questions very well, but let me, on the second referendum issue, uh, what Labour has proposed, of course, as you know, is, is the idea of a confirmatory vote. I mean, there's a lot of um, play with words in this, uh, in, in this saga, and one of them is it, to say, well, uh, we, we know that the problem with the second vote is that what would be the question? Now, it seems that the most logical question, uh, as put by Labour, and on this one I agree, is indeed to say, do you agree or not with the, the deal, by, Theresa May's deal? And if, you, and if you don't, then you would remain. You would just stay with the status quo. That is, of course, what the Remainers would like to see. The problem with that, though, is that, of course, the Brexiters, not only the hard Brexiters, will say, well, what about our option, which is de leaving but not on Theresa May's um, uh, terms? 
that won't be on the on, on the ballot. And and what if, let's say, a confirmatory vote does say uh, remain or not really refuses Theresa May's deal, but uh, with, um, uh, let's say, with 52, 53 percent, but much less than 17 million votes, where would be, which was, of course, the no vote in the first round, what would be the legitimacy of that? So then people agree, uh, will argue that the polarization of the country will, will remain indefinitely. And, therefore, and therein comes Rob's very important point, which is about rejoining. Under what condition we will need to ask in the future, not, not in today's panel, but you know, on, uh, will this be more likely? And, this might, um, and, and so if there is no second vote, partly I would argue that this will be more likely if we have a very soft and peaceful Brexit, um, indeed one where um, the Britain remains in most of the collaborative endeavors of, of the EU. And that has made a bit – I wouldn't be so always congratulatory about, uh, about the EU because I think the EU has made it for, until now, and I hope not for the future, but uh, has made it harder to have a kind of do-no-harm, gentle Brexit. It's made it harder in part because it's very binary in, it, in its approach. Either you are a third country or you're a member, and it's very hard to be in between. So we can't resolve everything today together, but we can ask, you know, what will it, in Brexit 2.0, the next phase of the negotiation, what, what will make it more likely that, we, um, that Britain can one day rejoin? Thank you. Uh, before I hand over to the two Robs for their comments, um, uh, just to say, I, you know, while I agree that the EU may have been tough during part of the negotiations, I think in the reality is that Britain's membership of the EU has always been something in between full membership and third country membership because Britain negotiated you know, an extensive array of opt-outs that have given it a kind of an interesting status, full political membership, but really uh, qualified and um, conditioned economic membership in various ways and membership of Schengen, the EMU and so on. So you know, I think Britain had its own deal, but the the binary vote was for something else. It was for something starker. And I think to some extent, maybe part of the EU's impatience may be in relation to that. Well, okay, what is it that you want? Um, but we've reached a stage now where I think uh, the, the, uh, the need is, and as, as I think the EU showed in its most recent uh, agreement to extend without conditions, it is showing more openness to a whole array of, of possibilities. But maybe I'll ask um, the two Robs to focus also on the question about whether um, Theresa May's agreement to step down, um, I don't know whether it's with condition, on condition that her deal is agreed or uh, not, or just an agreement to set a date to step down will make a difference. I don't think it matters. If, if you try to set a condition, you've got no authority to see it through anymore if she had any before. If I could just pick up two of those points first, and then I'll, I'll hand over to them quickly. But I think the really interesting thing now for the British government is that there's only two types of person left who can take over. Someone who, like Theresa May, has tried to avoid taking sides in order to keep her own party together, and it's difficult to see what that change is. Every other person within her party is aligned with a point of view, and any other winner splits the party in the way that she's been trying to avoid. So I think it's a very challenging time to... I mean, the, the it, it's a unique resignation, if we think of it like that, in that it is simultaneously both too soon and too late um, to actually have the effect that she wants. I think the Corbyn dynamic is a really interesting one because I think he really appeals to two different demographics. I think there is a young urban metropolitan elite attracted by his populism of the type that we were describing, but I also think he has a core ageless traditional left-wing uh, support group and the former find it more difficult to support him because of his reticence around a second vote, because he knows a second vote alienates the latter. And so he has his own challenge of, of that in trying to keep both. He cannot win an election without both their traditional voting population, the sort that didn't perhaps like Tony Blair as a Labour leader back in Corbyn, and that young vote continuing with the, the seduction that he's, he, he managed through the last election of, of impressing people with um, a degree that surprised the, you know, the press in the UK. So he's got to try to keep both on side. Indeed, indeed, yeah. And, and I mean, he comes from a traditional background of disliking the EU as a capitalist trick um, 
and has struggled to move much beyond that in his thinking as a leader, I think. So, we're, we're, and a large part of his population sees it as part of, in fact, protecting workers' rights, borderless, modern, forward-looking, and he, he's, that's a very difficult dilemma for him, which is why they've been very slow to come round to a second referendum. Uh, so I wanted to pick up on, um, uh, on something Calypso said, uh, you know, qualifying my um, praise of how um, the EU has handled this in, in a facilitative and non-punitive way, um, because I think that what she might be referring to in part, and correct me if I'm wrong, Calypso, is, is what happened, um, you know, before um, uh, the referendum, which is that uh, Cameron went uh, to uh, the EU and said that, um, you know, that there was considerable discontent or disagreement about um, Britain's place in the EU and tried to negotiate uh, concessions which would then be the basis, he thought, for winning a referendum in, in favor of EU membership. So, as I recall it, this was his initial strategy. and. Um, it was a strategy that met with little interest in, in Brussels, uh, where in particular um, there was one issue, I think, um, for good reasons <clears throat> that the EU did not want to compromise on, which was movement of people. And, and because if you compromised on that, then you would be really uh, opening the door to, you know, right-wing populism and all kinds of movements that existed within EU countries to try and curb uh, the movement of people, anti-migrant movements, and so on. So the movement of people was something that, to my mind, rightly, the EU could not compromise on uh, as uh, something that would allow the UK to be a full member of the EU because it would be uh, a member that was not respecting a core value, a real pillar of the, of the EU uh, legal and political uh, order. Um, but at the same time, and we know this from a lot of opinion polling, and again, uh, Calypso, who's a political scientist who can read these um, surveys much better than I can, will correct me, for what one might call hardline leave people, it was precisely um, my, the, the issue of migration and movement of people um, that, was, that was most important in, in, in their support for, um, you know, for Brexit. So I, I'm not sure that, the, that on, the, uh, on what would be a critical question, um, the EU could really have, um, have, have offered uh, a compromise that would have allowed Cameron to go into the referendum saying, okay, um, what we're really voting on now is Britain's continued membership based upon um, a renegotiated form of relationship or, or a renegotiated kind of full membership um, in the EU. And that goes to the very, it seems to me, poor thinking uh, right from the get-go about this whole exercise. Yes, just maybe to add to what Rob said, I think one of the interesting things about the ways ahead is this, I think there were two reasons for uh, the Brexit vote. There are two broad categories of reasons behind leave. One is indeed free movement, and that maybe comes from the areas that um, Calypso was talking about, um, those who uh, are from parts of Britain which have suffered economically, um, where there are unemployment issues, and there's a perception that free movement from the EU has um, been responsible in some ways for that, but also there's a blurring of migration issues from outside the EU with free movement within the EU. So that's one category, and I think, I'm not saying there's misinformation there, but it, the empirics of that are quite uh, contestable. But the second, which is one that you can't argue with empirically, is just about sovereignty, self control, self-rule, uh, independence, that older demographic of the UK that, that lived before the EU and never liked it, just, just never wanted membership of, of the EU. And it's not about this policy or that policy or free movement or not. I think maybe Rob, as someone living in the UK, can testify to that. And that's not something 
that you can negotiate with, that no, no amounts of concessions and this and that. That's why there's a hard Brexit vote, regardless of whatever is, is there. But there is then the free movement part, and I completely agree with uh, Rob Howes on this, that the, the EU couldn't concede on that, and also it wouldn't really have addressed anything. If they did, it would have been a symbolic pop right-wing populist concession for nothing. Um, and there is no country that has membership of the single market without free movement. The single market is always offered as four freedoms. The fourth is free movement of persons, and no one has a deal. There is a, a customs union option, which doesn't involve free movement, and which involves a, you know, um, a, a common customs union with an external, a common external tariff, but that doesn't necessarily entail single market membership. But any deal with single market membership comes with all four freedoms, and I think the EU's absolutely right to make that its reddest of red lines. There was an interview at the weekend with someone who was on the march for about, about, um, about having a second referendum, and uh, it was someone who'd originally voted to leave, and he said, um, I originally voted to leave because I wanted um, the great British Parliament, the mother of parliaments, to show the Europeans how it was done. And that's why, <laughs> that's why I've changed my mind. And I can, I can follow that, that line of logic. Um, I, I, I do think that, actually, we've highlighted a reason people did not leave, but which has played an, imp uh, 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 but which has played an important part in the debate, which is there, there are those within the government and the Conservative Party who say one of the critical red lines is getting the UK out of the European judicial system. Mm. It's a variant on sovereignty, but we yeah. don't want any of these European judges. Yeah, yeah. I never met a Brexit voter, and bear in mind, I live in central London, I don't mean that many, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but I'd never met a Brexit voter who actually said to me that there was a case decided by a European judge that had offended them. What they were interested in, to me, primarily, was free movement and, and, and often, sovereignty. Or if they were offended, it was the Strasbourg Court of Human Rights yes, they were exactly. talking about, you're, you're not the European right. Court. You're absolutely right. They're the wrong... But that was... I mean, people have that on the agenda, although it, to me, played almost no part in the way that people actually thought and voted. It was about free movement, and it was about their perception that the United Kingdom should be sovereign in its own way, and that that would bring benefits in the long term... Um, that, that's almost, it's, the, it's the, the version other than all politicians are bad. Mm -hmm. it's, if there are any good politicians, they're probably ours. It's that type mm -hmm. of sovereignty mm -hmm. feeling um, that, 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 that certainly plays some role. I think that's right. Um, if there aren't any other questions from the audience, feel free to put up your hand if there are. Maybe I'll just ask one more to get the panellists to reflect on, and that's, <coughs> you know, what the implications <coughs> are for the... Oh, there is one, sorry. Um, Janis at the back, yeah. Thanks. thanks. Um, actually, my question is a bit more general on what do you think is or should be the role of referenda in a democratic society? Um, because we have also seen, for example, referenda taking place in Greece and in Cyprus concerning the euro, and it also showed in those two countries, despite that they did not follow them, that they were a bit of very active against the euro but then it was decided that it was very bad disaster for those countries to follow what the people were saying, and hence they did not follow them. So what do you think is the role of people voting? When should it be, and what should be the limitations, if any? Thanks. Okay, so Yanis has asked, I'm repeating this also for uh, <coughs> Calypso's benefit, has asked, what should the role of referendum more generally be in democratic societies? We see them on the rise. Um, I just want to, before I hand over to Professor Nicolaides, just to say that one of, I won't say the ironies, but an, un an unusual feature in a way of the British referendum was that it's a non-binding referendum. Um, so this was a, a, a referendum. They don't, under the British constitutional system, bind the parliament or the government. Um, and yet it has become something almost, I would say, super binding. Um, you know, it, is, it, is, it is stands for something that, that to turn against the, what is understood to be the outcome of that referendum would be some kind of um, betrayal. So uh, let me turn over first to uh, Calypso. Would you like to address uh, that question, the role of referendum, that small question, the role of referendum in democracies? <laughs> Well, um, of course, it's an endless debate, and many are uncomfortable in Europe and in the Western world about referenda because, of course, they're simplistic and binary and all the rest of it. But I believe we should have a healthy respect for referenda. Uh, maybe I'm saying this because as a half-Greek person, 
But um, also, as a 21st century person, all the students in the room would agree that the biggest promise of our democracies is to reinvent the virtual democracy so that we can harness the power of the Internet to have better democracy. And indeed, it will be easier and easier in the future to have referenda, but maybe then ask, what kind? And um, at some point after the French and Dutch know, you know, in 2005, this seems like a lifetime ago, many of us kind of reflected on the fact that maybe we should have preferenda, that is referenda about preferences, upstream, not wait till we have a big, huge issue on which to vote yes or no, but much more regularly um, in the way of Switzerland, but adapted. We should have referenda where people indicate their preferences, maybe not just between two things, but three or four, and, we, and make a virtue out of this, as, after all, California and other states have done in, in the U.S. Um, this requires better education, better conditions, probably. But nevertheless, that's the great challenge of the future. And to me, that goes with the, you know, the bigger issue of, uh, of the new generations and how they can reinvent our democracies in Europe and in the United States. But can I add just a, a, a one small point about the future related to what you were all saying about free movement? You know, Grenia, you were kind enough to refer to the book that I'm publishing on, on Brexit, where I use a myth, mythology, and the Bible to try to understand Brexit. And one of my um, uh, frame is sacrifice, um, to read Brexit as sacrifice. And I think when we look at Brexit 2.0, what will happen next after this crazy moment of the saga today, we're going to want to ask, to what extent will the EU and Britain be creative, invent a new kind of adapted law? Because here is a, a forum in, at NYU Law School, and of course you all know European law, and there is a certain uh, mixture of you know, rigidity but also creativity, because you lawyers can be super creative. Um, and and to, sometimes the Brexit negotiations, as they've unfolded until now, seem a bit to sacrifice the UK on the altar or of a not too, uh, a quite rigid interpretation of EU law when we call this integrity of the single market and indivisibility and autonomy, all these great terms. And yes, they are important. But when you think of the role of the UK in Europe and in the Western world, it will be important also not to let it drift and, and do its thing all alone in the Dunkirk spirit of, of independence and, and keep it um, in, in the realm of EU law. And for that, we will require creativity in the application of EU law. So watch this space. Brexit 2.0 is to come, and I hope and believe that um, lawyers will be infinitely creative to create positive sum outcomes at last. Thank you, Calypso. Would either of you two like to make a final comment on the referenda question or any, any other? Rob, you might have something to say on uh, bro referenda. Broadly, I, I, I take the same view as Calypso. I, uh, I don't think that you know, a, a general skepticism uh, or host uh, towards or hostility towards referenda is merited. And, you know, Referenda have resulted in many positive political outcomes, um, progressive ones, as well as ones that, you know, people uh, might view as kind of reactionary or um, representing the revenge of sort of, um, you know, uh, or anger of um, uh, of the discontents. Um, in, in it. And so, um, uh, but what I do think is and Canada has gone some way towards this in the in respect of Quebec secession, um, which is to define the legal rules of the game, which was not done in the, in the UK, um, uh, both through constitutional litigation and through um, and through statute about what uh, a referendum means, and we have the doctrine in Canada of a um, clear majority on a clear question. Of course, that itself requires interpretation, but one might think of you know, requiring supermajority votes for constitutional changes. <clears throat> and also, and this goes to the, the question, um, you know, not making the referenda fully binding so that the, the outcome still has to be 
to some extent um, reviewed and possibly uh, modified uh, through representative political institutions. So, so there's some kind of dialogue between direct and representative democracy. Can I make a, a one minute observation on the future? Um, let us assume that one way or another the UK leaves the EU. At some point in the future, this question may crop up again, but it strikes me at least two things have to occur that I cannot get my head around. And one is a British political party would have to want to reopen this question. And that has proved pretty disastrous for all of them so far because they do not have a united view on it. And it splits any party that wants to push a position on it. That would be challenging. And the European Union has to answer the question, so we want these guys back because... And I see both of those as challenging questions in the medium term. Now, in the long term, those people have short memories. And we could be in a different situation, but the, the, it, it's difficult for me to see the current either constitutional or political setup in the UK making, reopening the debate wherever we end up through this next phase a challenging one. For those who are trying to defeat Brexit, now is their opportunity. Uh, I suspect that, that if Scotland votes clearly for independence, that may be one trigger for opening this up. Well, on that note <laughs> of speculation, we all have to go back and see what's happened while we've been sitting <laughs> yeah. here, <laughs> obviously a lot. Um, thank you so much to our, our three <coughs> panellists, to Calypso from <coughs> Toronto, to Rob Moulton and Rob Howe. Right.